All right, so our next speaker is Asia Hudson. And Asia is a California native who grew up loving the water despite her fear of it. And she wants to add to the scientific efforts to better understand the marine ecosystem. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that this summer, we, I sort of showed some photos of what our summer situation was with the tent and um, the long days and everything. And something I think about when I think about Asia this summer is that she, every single class, every day, she was never late a single time. She never missed a class, I don't think, the whole summer. She always had deeply provocative, sometimes probing questions for our speakers and well-considered answers to the questions that our speakers asked. And that really stands out to me from this summer um, in terms of Asia. Getting to know her a little bit over the course of the program, I think it is clear that what makes Asia tick is science, data, R, <laughs> charts, graphs. Uh, she is, um, I just feel like it's been a real honor to just watch you grow as a scientist over the course of your time here and a real pr privilege to have you here in the program. Thank so, you. yeah. Most of my free time, ooh, maybe I should adjust this first, okay. Most of my free time since this program has been spent eating pizza, drinking coffee, and spending quality time with my dog. Most of my energy since the summer has been surrounding the capstone. What is a capstone? Who is a capstone? Why is a capstone? <laughs> most of my essential questions were answered, all except one. During my project, most of the questions have surrounded why are sharks important? The shark lover in me indignantly shouts out, because they are. <laughs> the tree tugger side that my dad so lovingly calls me looks out into the distance and whimsically says, because all species deserve to be here. But my scientist side, the side that needed to drive my capstone was silent. Why are sharks important to the ecosystem and humans? People's fear of sharks seems slightly irrational a thought I've had since I was a child. Don't get me wrong, I also would rather not have a six-foot leopard shark in my face, despite what statistics tell me on their harm to humans. This irrational fear of sharks makes it difficult to link the relevance that they hold to humans. And so my scientist side scratched her head for months. Why are sharks important to humans, let alone knowledge of the reproductive systems? Since the 1970s, there has been about a 70% decrease in shark populations. In 2014, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, released a report on sharks, rays, and chimeras. Out of 465 species of sharks, 74 are classified as threatened, about 16%. However, no information is on 209 shark species, making it about 256 that we have data on. This increases the percentage to about 29%. The IUCN states that of all species assessed, 28% are threatened with extinction. An analysis by the insurance firm Swiss Re in 2020 found that half of global GDP depends on high functioning biodiversity, yet about a fifth of countries globally are at risk of their ecosystems collapsing. So far during this presentation, I've talked about one level of biodiversity, what most people think of, the ecosystem level. But genetic diversity is also a necessary component in a healthy functioning ecosystem. Genetic variation leads to better diversity. More diversity leads to adaptations and resilience to external stressors. But to maintain diversity within a species, the gene pool needs enough individuals with varying genomic sequences. Multiple paternity increases the genetic diversity within a group of offspring and has been found to occur in many species, frogs, turtles, snakes, and fish. It may therefore be one way to ensure that threatened and at-risk species persist in a changing world. My capstone project focused on multiple paternity in sharks, mating involving one female and multiple males. I utilized data from Katie Leons, Davi Kasev, and Christopher Mull to assess what aspects of a shark may influence the rate of multiple paternity. 
one part of my end product uh, that will be given to minorities in shark sciences, MISS, is a comic that helps uh, explain shark reproduction and mating methods. You will find some of the things I created and some of the slides scattered throughout this presentation. Polyandry, multiple paternity, was once thought to be a rare form of mating, where a female copulates with multiple males. The resulting litter uh, results in half siblings and all of the pups have different fathers. As stated before, recent studies utilizing DNA extraction found that females across the animal kingdom participate in polyandry, and this method of mating is thought to increase the mother's fitness. Something that's not well known about sharks is that they have diverse methods of reproduction. Most people know, hopefully, that birds lay eggs, mammals give live birth, but with sharks, it turns out that all of these are potential options. A shark that lays eggs is a horn, one is a horn shark, and instead of a creative cryptic name for them, scientists came up with oviparous. The spiral egg case is in a traditional corkscrew shape and is a left amongst the rocks by the mother and because the mother does not actually protect the young. Over the course of 11 to 14 days, she lays about two eggs, totaling about 24 at the end of the season. Another is the oviviparous, uh, found in big, big eye thresher sharks, where the egg develops in the uterus, and rather than a placental connection with the mother, the fetuses are nourished by yolk stored in the yolk sacs and, and ovulated eggs. The eggs hatch within the mother, leading to live birth, and the mother will give birth to two to four young per litter. To make it wilder, hybrid reproduction methods um, found in usually you know, birds and mammals, like I said, are actually found in VV Paris sharks, um, like the smooth dogfish, and they give live birth and have placental connections similar to mammals. Despite the varied modes of reproduction, multiple paternity behavior in sharks has been recorded in many species um, across the taxa. Available data indicates that the origin of polyandry as a mating method has come from a common ancestor. We did a pure phylogenetic analysis. Phylogenetic, referring to the diagram that depicts the relationships among species, like the one on the pre previous slide. We ran this analysis to assess the shared evolutionary relationship that would lead to occurrence of multiple paternity in uh, the shark species. But evolution is not the only factor, and life, life history characteristics are also an influence. With the help of Eric Archer, we created a global life history model and a pairwise logistics model in R to test some of the life history traits. The global life history model compared all species simultaneously, and the pairwise logistics model compared each species one at a time to each other to see how their differences affect multiple paternity and the life history. The phylogenetic analysis did not utilize the predictor variables, but the two models do. To understand how life history affects multiple paternity, I first had to determine what life history variables affect the rate of multiple paternity. Um, I ended up using variables that affect the number of offspring that a shark could, you know, a mother could um, have for breeding. This took weeks. <laughs> Going through scientific literature, um, banging my head against the computer because there is such a wide gap. Family, order, and phylogenetic distance are in reference to the evolution and the phylogenetic tree. Maximum age is the oldest age that I was able to find for the species. Female age of maturity has three parts. The average age of maturity, the range of the age of maturity, the upper and lower values. The range was necessary for this variable because sharks are widespread and cryptic and so it's hard to know exactly when the species actually reaches female maturity age. Breeding years was calculated by taking the difference in maximum age and the average female age of maturity. Reproduction mode refers to the three that we previously spoke on, OVV parity, OV parity, and VV parity, and the IUCN status I collected through the IUCN website. We ranked the IUCN status with critically endangered being the highest, followed by endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, least concerned, and data deficient. Critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable are species threatened with global extinction. Near threatened are species close to the threatened thresholds or would be threatened without ongoing conservation. 
Least concerned are species who have been evaluated to have lower risk of extinction, and data deficient are species that currently have no assessment done because of insufficient data. We found that the lower the age of female maturity in a species, the lower the potential breeding years. Each dot represents one of the 30 or so species that we have data on. The blue line is a regression line. It shows that as the female age of maturity increases, so does the potential breeding years. Many of the lowered value dots are within the gray shading, indicating a strong relationship between age and maturity and maximum age. We also found that the lower the age of female maturity in a species, the lower the maximum age. The blue line shows that as the female age of maturity increases, so does the maximum age of the species. Many of the lower value dots are within the gray shading, indicating a strong relationship between age and maturity and maximum age. The lower the maximum age, the lower the age of female maturity. The lower the female age of maturity, the lower the potential breeding years. This relationship is also seen in longer lived species, but replaced low with high. I hypothesized that species with lower age and maturity will show higher frequencies of multiple paternity. My reasoning is that due to the increase in a mother's fitness in multiple paternity, species with less potential breeding years have more to gain by participating in this mating method. Drivers of multiple paternity are not well understood, with most hypotheses focusing on direct or indirect benefits, and others focused on um, polyandry as a byproduct of competition. Multiple paternity is generally viewed in a binary fashion to explain the occurrence, the presence, or absence of it within a clade or a taxa, and or as a comparison amongst populations, so looking at one species. Um, and we investigated potential predictors that may influence the frequency of multiple paternity. Before we ran the statistical models, um, I wanted to determine how strong of an influence evolution had on the rate of polyandry. And so with the help of Greg Rouse, I built a phylogenetic tree with two characters, endangered status and polyandry presence. This snapshot is only a small portion of the tree. It would not have fit on the screen. <laughs> After conducting a visual assessment, I found no obvious patterns or clustering for the characterization of multiple paternity. However, to note, as highlighted with the purple boxes, there were five uh, species that did not have uh, multiple paternity at all. Only three were able to be fit on this screen. However, um, for the characterization of endangered, there were a few clustering scattered throughout the tree. Um, not a lot had you know, the five, or five to seven that is on the top orange box. Most of them were kind of grouped in two to threes. We could not, unfortunately, using Mesquite, do any more analysis with this because of the large gap of data we had with multiple paternity um, and also with the IUCN status. We could, however, assess the relationship between the life history characteristics and the rate of multiple paternity. As part of the global life history model, we built a posterior plot showing the distribution of the probability of multiple paternity occurring for each species. Oops, go back, sorry. This one is for the black no shark. Um, all you really need to know about this graph is that any significant value that falls within the two shaded areas was determined to be credible. The models determined that phylogenetic distance is not the only driver of polyandry in sharks, that life history characteristics do hold some influence over the rate of polyandry. The models also determined that the lower age of female maturity, the higher the frequency of polyandry, and that the longer lived a species, the lower the frequency of polyandry. These results support my hypothesis in that species with lower ages of maturity show higher occurrences of multiple paternity. A possible explanation for this could be the amount of breeding years the species have. However, that requires more complex modeling, which I plan to do after this program ends. And so my scientist side was stimulated. Sharks are important in the grand scheme of things. A loss of sharks could negatively impact coastal economies, meaning marine tourism, scuba diving, snorkeling, fishing, because sharks as apex predators help maintain the biodiversity within the ecosystem that they live. Unfortunately, we don't really know how bad the loss of sharks would impact the ecosystems or the economy as we don't have much information on sharks. The knowledge of sharks and their reproductive methods can also lead to better conservation methods in the future. 
My study also found that with the endangered IUCN status, species uh, have less rates of polyandry. Could that mean that endangered species are longer lived and have a longer breeding period? A question I hope to discover with more time. I'd like to thank my capstone committee members, Davi Kasev, Gregory Rouse, and Eric Archer. I'd like to thank my supplemental support. They were integral, even if they weren't on my capstone committee. And of course, mom, don't kill me. Um, I'd like to thank my parents um, for supporting me and you know, understanding the random cries in the corner. <laughs> and this is an example of one of the comics slash infographics that I designed for Miss. Um, I will leave it up while I take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, I would actually like to hear a little bit more about what MISS is and your involvement with them, if you don't mind sharing. Uh, so MISS is a organization that was, I believe they came on their two year anniversary this year, um, created by Jasmine Graham, who found a um, severe lack of minorities in sciences, especially shark sciences, and so she took it upon herself to create this organization and created an, a network that has a bunch of uh, women, minorities, um, marginalized groups within it, um, specifically for shark sciences. It's in the name, Miss. Um, and so I heard from her during the summer and she has a wider network than I currently have. And so I figured, let me make this comic to help disseminate towards kids and you know, sharks are cool, not really something to be fearful of, kind of, yes, question? Asia, were there any unexpected patterns or relationships presented after you ran either of the two models? Um, yeah, so I do have, is this the one I wanna use? Yes, okay. Um, so for the pairwise logistics model, we did find, that was the comparison of species to species and using the differences to look at the rate of multiple paternity and how that influenced each other. Um, and we did find that the, let's pull it up. So if you see the average female age of maturity has a positive median value, while the lower and upper values have negative values, you wouldn't really expect to see that. You would think they're all technically within the same category, right? They're like that three variable um, in one. And so having that the lower and upper values have an inverse relationship with multiple paternities, meaning that the lower the age of female maturity, that the higher the rates of polyandry, and, but the average female maturity is showing that as the female maturity increases, so does the rate of um, polyandry, which is weird. Um, we currently don't have any explanation for that. That's again, the more complex modeling that we're gonna do. Um, so to be determined. Thanks, Asia, for your presentation. Um, so you tackled two very different and very time intensive, it seems, projects to do both a graphic design output and uh, such an intensive research analysis project. One, why did you decide to tackle <laughs> such uh, big projects? And two, what was most challenging for you and how did you overcome those challenges balancing those two projects? Uh, yeah. Um that is a very insightful question because I didn't realize until the end that it was kind of like, oh, you did two capstones almost. Um, so the statistical modeling was very much supplemented and helped by Eric Archer. I would n probably not have been able to complete what I have without his integral support. Um, and so the R aspect was kind of alleviated and not as you know banging my head against the computer as it could have been. Um, so probably the most difficult and time consuming part was the graphic mo um, design because I've never used Adobe Illustrator. So, I mean, I went from it taking me four hours to just design one shark to I got it done in within like 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, the graphic design was definitely the most difficult part. And I, I always had 
some educational outreach tool, um, but through talks with my capstone chair, we determined that for the demographic that I was targeting, that would be a better way to disseminate that information versus you know something that probably adults would be more in line with versus what kids would be.